Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today we are talking about some behind the scenes details of the Monroe 4688 Model Y teardown they have shared on Reddit. Also got some news on Tesla sales in China, second quarter production for Rivian, some updates on the Boring Company, and more. Not too much action with the stock today, Tesla finishing down six tenths of a percent to close at $695.20, while the Nasdaq was up about a third of a percent. This was following the release of the Fed meeting minutes from the June meeting, which the market seemed to take in stride. Not too much volatility, a little bit, but not too much volatility following that release. Quick reminder here at the start, as we do have a lot of Tesla shares represented in this audience, make sure to vote your shares for Tesla's annual meeting. Tesla today sent a reminder out about doing that. This will determine if Tesla is able to do their three for one stock split as they intend. Oftentimes, I think a lot of retail shareholders just kind of write these things off and don't worry about voting because they, you know, assume that they're not going to affect the vote. This is not true. Tesla in this email notes that there are about 6 million Tesla shareholders, a lot of those being retail investors. And yeah, passive funds have a lot of shares, but retail shareholders have a lot of shares too, especially for a company like Tesla. So it is important to vote. I don't care how you vote, but it is important to vote. Tesla has made this very easy. They've put together a guide on how to vote across many different brokerages, and I will link to that page in the description. I've already voted all my shares. It takes like 30 seconds. I did vote with Tesla's board's recommendation because generally I believe in Tesla's leadership, but again, don't care how you vote. Just make sure that you do. All right, so first up today, I want to talk a little bit more about the 4680 Model Y teardown that Monroe and Associates are doing. We talked about them starting off that process yesterday. We got a few interesting details from that first video, but I think more interestingly today, we have some behind the scenes details that have been shared by one of the associates from Monroe and Associates, Stuart, who was answering some questions and sharing some information on Reddit about the teardown yesterday. So we'll go through some of his comments here, and I think a great place to start is how he believes this will impact Tesla's production process. I think we all understand that the structural pack, 4680s, those can be big contributors to speeding up and simplifying production, and I think Stuart explained that very well here. He wrote, quote, I think the big save is being able to get rid of the load floor in the body in white. It might not be a weight save at all in the end, but it's definitely a cost save at a piece cost level and a systemic level by eliminating part numbers, warranty claims, and scrap due to those part numbers, etc. One of my larger concerns as a mechanical engineer with a background in industrial engineering and just being an ethical person is always ergonomics. Being able to get inside the body and stand up to install the interior trim with a pushing motion rather than a crawl around in the body over pokey studs and brackets and lean-in door openings to install stuff with a pulling motion makes a huge difference in workplace safety and stress injuries." End quote. He expanded on this in another comment saying that this simplifies the installation of lots of other interior trim, greatly increases safety and ergonomics, and thus time on the line. So even though from a customer perspective at this point we may not be seeing all of the full potential of 4680 cells, structural pack, etc. quite yet, this is a great reminder of some of the specific advantages that Tesla should be realizing in the production process already. As for some of the other advantages Elon did note on Twitter yesterday that quote structural pack is the right overall architecture from a physics standpoint, but it is still far from optimized, end quote. I think just going off of some of the very early information we have from Drew's comments on the earnings call to the teardown from Jordan at the limiting factor, plus some of the details that have come out about acceleration and charging performance at the very end of the charge at 0%, suggesting that there's a bit of a buffer here. It definitely seems like Tesla is being very conservative in all areas so far, which makes sense for an early iteration. And as they get more experience with it, they can push the energy density through chemistry changes. They can potentially reduce some of the thickness that we're seeing around the cells themselves as they are acting as a structural element, but hopefully some of that can be improved on over time. And then as they learn more about degradation, potentially they could reduce some of that buffer that we're seeming to see right now. So on one hand, maybe the specs here right off the bat aren't as exciting as what we'd hoped from battery day, but Tesla has been very consistent in their communication that there is a lot of progress still left to be made, and that part is definitely exciting. All right, a couple other comments here from Stuart. In the video yesterday, they had talked about the weight of the pack and how it was about half of the weight of some of the other packs that they had had, even though they had the seats on there, they had the center console on there. I didn't comment on that yesterday because even though the weight here is less, they were comparing against larger packs like with Rivian, that's like twice as much energy capacity, so yeah, it should be a lot heavier. So Stuart here saying that personally he thinks that the battery will be heavier than the 2020 Model Y, but there isn't going to be some perfect weight comparison between the batteries because, again, the 4680 pack is structural, so it eliminates some of the load floor parts and their weight, but some of that is built back into the battery pack. I think as we have already talked about, some of the expected weight savings have seemed to be diminished a little bit by energy density at the cell level, but We'll definitely learn more about that, or at least hopefully learn more about that through the teardown. And then for the last couple of details that Stuart shared first on the simplicity of removing the pack, he said that, quote, 
This pack came out faster than just about any pack I've ever seen here, end quote. And he did also confirm that the pack is liquid cooled. Definitely no surprise on that. Tesla's other packs are liquid cooled as well, but always good to get confirmation. So good to get more of those details, especially the stuff on production and ergonomics I thought was helpful. And we'll keep watching for any updates as this teardown continues. All right, next we've got an update on Tesla in China. Reuters today is reporting that Tesla has sold around 78,000 Shanghai made vehicles in June, according to preliminary estimates shared by the China Passenger Car Association, which of course publishes those numbers each month. And we should get those final numbers within the next few days. Anyway, that should be very close to the final number. So if we look at this in comparison to previous months, this should easily be a record month for sales in China for Tesla, about 10% above the previous high of 70,600 from December 2021. But of course, doesn't mean a whole lot coming off of the really low months from April and May with the lockdowns in those months. Now, this can give us a little bit of insight into production. Of course, we already have the worldwide production number, but knowing China's production will help us determine how productive Fremont, Berlin, and Texas in combination were, and also the production rates, of course, that Shanghai was able to hit in June, although those are a little bit less important than normal because we know Tesla right now is working on upgrading those production rates. So anyway, as we always talk about the sales numbers here, that's different than production, and what's most important to recognize with the sales number is that in April and May, Tesla had built inventory, so produced more than they had sold by about 10,000 vehicles in China. So that inventory should be drawn down pretty significantly, probably not in its entirety in June, which means we're probably looking at a production number right around 70,000 plus or minus maybe 1,500 vehicles like we've been expecting. So this seems right on track, but again, we should get that final information within the next few days. While we are talking a little bit about production here, I did want to shift over to Rivian because today they reported their second quarter production number. They announced in the second quarter they have produced and delivered just over 4,400 vehicles. So a pretty good increase for both deliveries were increased more because deliveries lagged production for Rivian in Q1 pretty significantly, but production is quite a bit more interesting to follow. So I have mapped this out now that we've got about four quarters of data for production for Rivian. While there certainly are problems within the business, particularly their cost control, I think they have actually done a pretty solid job of ramping up production here. Got a very nice and consistent growth curve. And Rivian did note that they do believe that they are on track to deliver on 25,000 vehicles produced for the year even though Q1 and Q2 total production was about 7,000 vehicles. The growth so far has plotted along a very nice curve. If we extend that out to Q3 and Q4, it looks like Rivian could be on track for something like 7,000 vehicles in Q3, maybe 9,500 in Q4. So just from that simple curve, they would seem to be tracking towards somewhere around 23,500 for the year. But of course, they could outperform and accelerate their production ramp a little bit from where it has been in the second half. So that 25,000 annual production target, that does still seem to be within reach. So yeah, maybe not directly Tesla related here, but I think it's interesting to follow the ramp nonetheless for Rivian and good to see some progress here, at least in terms of their production rates. All right, back over to Tesla. Elon yesterday was asked about how long it might be until the Teslas in the boring company are using FSD in the tunnels. And Elon replied with maybe later this year. So we've talked about this a few times, couple of thoughts on this. First off, my understanding is that so far the hangup has been with local government there, which even at the request of the boring company has not allowed the boring company to use even autopilot in the tunnels with the drivers there paying attention. So that kind of leads into the next thought. If Elon is saying that maybe later this year they'd be using FSD, that doesn't necessarily mean they would be taking drivers out. Might just be getting to the point where the county is more comfortable with allowing the drivers to actually utilize FSD or autopilot within the tunnels. But I don't see any reason to expect that all of a sudden they would go from not even using any autopilot to completely going to FSD without any drivers. It would make sense for there to be a relatively long period of time testing with FSD with drivers there to monitor. Plus, if they were to remove the drivers, Tesla would probably have to build some software to facilitate that, in particular, managing safe pickup and drop off of passengers. So maybe Elon means completely autonomous by the end of the year. As we've talked about before, I do think the boring company tunnels are going to be the first place that we do end up seeing Tesla cars with no drivers, but I don't think we have seen nearly enough of what are likely to be prerequisites for that to happen anytime this year. Now, sure, maybe some of that stuff has been developed in the background and we're just not aware of it, but it seems unlikely given Elon's pretty consistent comments about how they choose to apply their efforts and 100% of the focus being on just getting FSD solved as best they can, rather than any efforts around facilitating customer interaction. But that said, even getting to use the FSD beta in these tunnels for these drivers, I think would be an exciting and overdue step. And again, gets us a little bit closer towards that eventual path. 
and also works to demonstrate those features to the thousands and thousands of riders that these vehicles are going to have. So that's the main update on the Boring Company, and then there is another one here. It has been reported that the Boring Company is accepting Doge as a payment option for rides within the tunnel. Elon did comment on that today on Twitter, said that he is supporting Doge wherever possible. All right, last item for today, just kind of an interesting thing that is happening this week. The investment company Allen & Company holds an annual media and technology conference in Sun Valley, Idaho. That is going on this week and oftentimes has one of the most prominent guest lists of any event in the world. It's been rumored that some really big historical business deals have gone down at this conference in the past. Not that we'll get a ton of information out of it, but Elon Musk is on the guest list and Vanity Fair has reported that he is expected to attend for the first time in several years. So maybe we'll see some reporting on that later this week. We'll just have to wait and see. All right, that'll wrap it up for today then. Again, just a quick reminder to vote your shares for the annual meeting. Again, the link to do that will be in the description. But as always, thank you for listening. Make sure you're subscribed and signed up for notifications. You can also find me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast. And we'll see you tomorrow for the Thursday, July 7th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.